let's jump into this. Let me have the the first question here. What year was OBD two mandatory? 1996. But I will tell you that that book is mildly incorrect on that because there were some 1987 model one-ton pickups that had OBD-1 on them. And there's other material that you'll find that say it wasn't absolutely drop-dead mandatory until 1998. You understand what I'm saying? So just keep that in mind, all right? So uh, 96 is the closest good answer you're gonna get on that one because none of those other answers, 94 is wrong, 01 is wrong, 88 is wrong. I will tell you that 88 was the first year that any Ford product had a check engine light on it. General Motors got check engine lights on theirs in 80 or 81, and uh, the people that were driving those cars said the, the most reliable component on that car was the check engine light. It's, it worked, when nothing else would, the check engine light would come on. Well, did Ford have a license check engine light? No. They stayed away from that for a long time because they didn't like having a light. But finally, the EPA made it put one on in 88. Because it was a problem. It was always a problem, you know, always popping on, aggravating the customers and all that kind of stuff. Uh, which OBD2 term describes the check engine light? The malfunction indicator light, MIL. All of these are OBD2 requirements except A, detect component degradation or faulty emission, in con con excuse me, emission control operation. B, tell the technician what's wrong with the engine. C, alert the driver of necessary emission-related repairs or service, or D, use standardized DTCs and accept a generic scan tool. All of those are OBD2's requirements except one. Which one is not an OBD2 requirement? Hmm? You know good and doggone well that a scan tool is not gonna tell the technician, what's wrong with the engine? No, it's gotta be B, that's gotta be a B, okay? OBD2 requires the PCM to detect faults allowing emissions to exceed how many times the FTF standard? 1.5, that's number four. That is number four, you got that? Everybody got that, 1.5. That's a dog. All of these are continuous monitors in OBD except A, comprehensive component monitor, B, catalyst monitor, C, fuel monitor, or D, misfire monitor. Right, that's going to be a, okay, so what did, tell, me, what, tell me what's a, a continuous monitor. Okay, so what you got here, your, you know, the components that are sending inputs uh, that are hard and fast inputs would be like your uh, throttle position, engine coolant temperature, oxygen sensors, and all this. Now, how does it monitor the catalyst? Where? Behind the catalyst, right? Yeah, behind the catalyst converter. And how can you look at that oxygen sensor signal and tell if the catalyst is good or bad? If you were going to look at it yourself. No, actually that's backwards. Yeah. But no, you're, the oxygen sensor is not looking at temperature. What the oxygen sensor on that one is looking at oxygen storage capacity of the light off cat, which is the front one. There's two cats. Yeah. There's a cat in the front and a cat behind that one. The only one that's being monitored is the one in the front. The one in the back is not being monitored. Now, on some of these cars, they want the, they want the light off cat to get all the heat it can. You'll have the engine here, you'll have the manifold coming out, and then you'll have a little cat right here. And then it goes under the car, and it'll go back here to another cat. And then it goes to through a resonator or muffler or whatever. They'll have an oxygen sensor right here. They'll have an oxygen sensor right there. Now if you're monitoring this one down here, it ought to be pretty lazy. If you're monitoring this one, it'll be like that. 
If these are switching together, in Houston we have a problem. PO420 code, what you're going to get? PO420. Now, if that catalyst is contaminated with stuff, you know, like somebody's, something happened and caused it to burn some oil and it kind of, you know, caked the catalyst up with oil. In some cases, you can, you know, heat the catalyst up by running it lean and cook that stuff off of it. But usually, when you got a PO420, you got to replace the catalyst. What confuses people, and this is important, so pay attention to this, is, and I had this happen at the uh, dealership over here. Uh, I pulled a code and found a PO420 and looked at my readings. I said, yep, it's about to have a catalyst. And so uh, the uh, catalyst was ordered. I went in there and told them, give me a catalytic converter for this car. So they ordered it. It was under warranty anyway. And so whenever the catalyst came in, the goofy parts man, which I should have been more, you know, he didn't ask me which one because there were two. He ordered the one back here. So they threw it at another guy because I was wrapped up with drivability work, and he just popped this catalyst on there and threw it back out on the yard. He didn't even know why the catalyst was being changed. And they came back mad as a hatter because their PO420 came back. And so I looked, and they had replaced the one that the oxygen sensors weren't sniffing. They didn't replace the one that needed to be replaced. So we had to get another one. But what was funnier than that was about two years later, I was working here by that time, and this girl from up front came back here on her little Mazda 626 or whatever it was, some kind of little Mazda car, a uh, four-cylinder, and set up the same way because that car I was working on was a Mazda, you know, clone. And so uh, I said, you got a PO420, needs a catalytic that's under warranty. Go to the Lincoln Mercury place, another friend, I'm going to take care of it for you. So she goes to the Lincoln Mercury place. Uh, she comes back after they put the catalyst on there, and she goes, I've still got a check engine light. So I plugged it in, PO420. They had changed that one. <laughs> Happened Same over there too. So I called over there and talked to Jonathan Chavez, the guy that worked over there. I said, Jonathan, y'all changed your own cat on this car. No way. I said, yeah. The, one, the front one's the one that needed to be changed for a PO420. Y'all should have known that. He said, well, somebody else did it. So anyway, that's the kind of stuff you got to really pay attention to. Depends on whether what your model is. Okay, he just put it all back together and tell him that when he comes back, he needs to. Do not let him take that truck without going to pay that five bucks. I need to keep you that truck in my pocket. Okay. I said, he, he, said, he wrote a work order. He's got over five bucks for to take the truck. He's got to go to work at, at one. So he needs to go pay that bill before he can take the truck. Okay? All right. All right. So anyway, uh, what we got here is uh, knowing how this system operates and understanding it is, is, a, is a big part of that. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, we used to have... That uh, sable out there, I think, had a bad catalyst on it, so you could actually watch those oxygen sensors switch at the same rate. But you can look at them. If you graph the front and the rear oxygen sensor, uh, you know which ones to switch? If I'm going to tell you um, HO2S, S11, which one is that? HO2S12. HO2S22, or 21, excuse me, I meant to write 21, and HO2S22. If you're considering a bad oxygen sensor because of a heater problem in the sensor or something, they'll throw codes for that too. You better know which one you're working on, or you may change this one when you needed to change another one somewhere. You better know which one's which. Now, can, does anybody understand these? Anybody understand which ones those are? Which one? If I've got a, let's just draw it. And this is, a, this is the kind of stuff I need to tell you or I'll forget if I don't. All right, this is looking at the, let's say it's a V8. And there's your fan, and you know, just to give you an idea of where it's in the front. And it's put you a little throttle body here or whatever. All right, now I'm going to take and come off of here with exhaust on both sides. All right? And then I'm going to go to my cap. I got a sensor here, I got one there, I got one there, I got one there. All right. Now, which one of these cylinders on this thing is cylinder number one? Ah, good question. Let's say it's a Chevy. One, if it's a Ford, it's over here. Bank one is always going to be the one in number one cylinder, though.
shoot and cut a cover and burn off any vehicles against the law. All right, right here, we got the, yeah. it, he's not supposed to do it. It's, a, it's against the law. We're not even going to talk about it because it's against the law to cut a cover and burn off. It's been like that forever. And if the federal government decides they want to start raising some revenue, they're going to come around looking up in your car. Will you cut this off $10,000, please? You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's how that works. All right. How did we get to that point? We're trying to talk about oxygen sensors, and somebody got us off track. Who was that? Okay, what's this? This one right here. Now, pay attention to this, because this is a, an important little thing I'm doing here. Okay, this is HO2S1 slash 1, and this is 1 slash 2. This is 2 slash 1, and that's 2 slash 2. Remember that. If it's that 1, 1 is going to be on bank 1. If it's a 4, it's going to be over here. So don't get confused. You know, and uh, we had a, a pickup truck one time. Or, I mean, I'm sorry, I was working on a Thunderbird. That's what it was. When this first came around in 1994, I was working on one, and I was getting a code for the oxygen sensor heater. And I went on one particular oxygen sensor on my scan tool, and I was thinking, okay, which one is which? And I, somehow or another, I numbered them in my mind wrong, and I was working on the wrong one. You know, so don't go there. You make sure you know which one's which before you go yeah. swapping out an oxygen sensor. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now then. All right. Now what we got? Hmm. Say, let me see here. where we at here. Okay, that was a catalyst monitor. Which OBD2 monitor is designed to monitor failure in any electronic circuit that provides input or output signals to the PCM? Oh. Yeah, and, uh, well, I mean, yeah, is that right? That sounds pretty good to me. Well, yeah, everybody like that answer? <laughs> well, nobody doesn't like it, so let's go with that one. See, it sounds good to me. How many consecutive trips are required by the comprehensive component monitor to illuminate the mill? Three. Four. Three. Three. It depends, okay. Three. Three. Actually, it's consecutive trips. Three. Yeah, what page is he on for that? Um, yeah. The right answer is supposed to be two, but I will tell you, the uh, of course the it's a the misfire monitor will start the check engine light flashing the first time it starts misfiring, you know. But that's not the, the comprehensive component monitor. <coughs> you know what? Any of you guys know what a PO 128 or a PO 125? You ever seen those? No, there's going to be two. Two is the right answer. Um, but you're going to put. Um, if you got a PO128 or a PO125, uh, uh, you guys that put the thermostat on the Mazda 3 yesterday, mm -hmm. you were fixing a PO128. And what that means is the engine's running a little bit too cold. But, it, you know, it's running colder than it should. Also, also and, uh, too hot. Yeah, it's not going to throw you a code. Well, it can throw you a code for that, but it'll be a sensor related code. But, uh, typically, it's, worri it's worried about it running too. Uh, too cold because you don't really have an indicator except for your eyeballs. Most people feel like if the needle's down, it's okay, uh, you know. But it's not healthy for the engine or the emissions or anything else for it to run too cold. So they want it to run about 200 degrees. That's why that's only a coolant fan that can kick on a ship like a Chevrolet Cavalier until 228. You know, yeah. that's pretty darn hot. It'll scare you, you know. You drive a Cavalier, don't you? You scared of that? Can't you? Be. That's all I got to say. All right. Okay. Which type of misfire occurs at least once per 200 engine revolutions and causes the mill to blink once per second? Okay. Wait a minute. Now. Okay, are you sure? Mm -hmm. Everybody sure about that? Mm -hmm. Type A misfire. Mm -hmm. Type B misfire occurs at least once per how many engine revolutions? Thousand. Once per thousand. That was an A2. Which diagnostic trouble ser code series used to report misfires? B, B the PO300 series. If it's got a PO300, what does that code mean? If you're just, if you're just seeing a PO300. PO300 means what? Multiple cylinder misfires. It means it's misfiring on this one and that one and the other one, not on any particular cylinder. All right. Which diagnostic trouble code series, let's see, excuse me, it's the wrong one. Which term describes a set of conditions Required to allow each monitor to run. 
enabling criteria, comprehensive component monitor, diagnostic flow chart, or MIL. You sure? What is it? Did you find that in the book or are you just guessing? That's it. We got, we got to have a, an extra 30 minutes today on our lecture because people didn't read the book. Enabling criteria is the name of the game, guys. What in the world would I want to run an evaporative system monitor? In other words, if an evaporative system monitor is the one that gives you your peel 455 like when they leave the gas cap off, what if somebody... What if somebody leaves the gas cap completely off all the time, but it never throws a PO 455? Why would that be? Yeah. Well, it's got a whole, there's a there's a bevy of codes for evaporative stuff, so yeah, you're not you're not out of line there. But, yeah. Well, I don't throw a code though, should it? What is the enabling criteria for the evaporative system monitor? The gas level, the tank, in, the gas, the, the, the PCM is looking at the level of gas in the gas tank, and if it's below 15 percent or above 85 percent, it won't run those that monitor. So the enabling criteria on that particular monitor it has to be between 15 and 85 percent. You got that? You understand what I'm saying? If they always keep it topped off like my wife does, when her car gets down just above three quarters of a tank, up, got to go fill it up. <laughs> Got to go fill it up. Got to fill up her car, you know. Well, I mean, she keeps it full. So she's never going to have an evaporative code as long as she keeps that thing full of gas. See, my grandmother has a 2005 Buick Passat. Don't let that thing go under half a pound of gas. Or she'll surely die. Well, it keeps saying that the gas cap is loose. Mm -hmm. When you change the gas, the gas is Well, it doesn't say the gas cap is loose. It says you've got a big leak. No. Well, that'd be the same deal. Yeah. yeah. Now they do have a little uh, on the really new ones. You know what year is it? Yeah, on the newer ones, they're going to have a little thing that whenever the uh, level in the gas goes up, and then it sees a big leak after that, it can throw you a gas cap indicator if it's got that kind of warning on it. But uh, that's probably going to be a trouble with the uh, gas tank sending unit, I imagine, on that one. Because it's looking at that all the time, and uh, I'm just guessing at that. I may be wrong about that, but anyway. Uh, but you've already changed the gas cap twice, and you hadn't fixed it. I'd say you need to look somewhere else. Okay. Which term describes the variety of operating conditions required to run all active tests and monitors? Come on, you guys. Twelve is one we're after. Which one is it? What do you call it? Everybody's sitting there, hoping I'll give them the answer, so they don't have to read nothing in the book. All right. What is it? Number 12. What is it? B. How, how many people can say drive cycle? If you just said drive cycle, I would have heard you. All right. I said B. Yeah. You're supposed to say drive cycle, not B. Okay. Yeah. Which term describes a drive cycle that meets all the enabling criteria for a particular test? That's a trip. You're going to call that a trip. A customer states her MIL is blinking. Technician A says this condition may damage the catalytic converter if the customer continues driving. Technician B says freeze frame data should be stored. Yeah. Well, well Does anybody else in here have the answer to that? What does a blinking LED mean? I mean, LED. What does a blinking MIL mean? Duh. What does a blinking MIL mean? I don't want to hear you got a problem. We were just talked about it a minute ago. And the only one, there's only one time when the MIL blinks. All right. A really, a type A misfire. Okay, so if you've got a type A misfire, chances are you got a bunch of raw gas going into the catalytic converter, which is already running at over 1,000 degrees. 1500, you add that extra gas to it, it gets red hot and it melts down. So you're actually, the, the blinking light's not damaging the converter, the blinking light's warning you of a condition that can damage the converter. And that is why that on a lot of these vehicles, there is a, uh, well, there's a little short story here on a uh, 
Ford Windstar one time I was working on. I was looking at this uh, one that whenever you'd crack the throttle a little bit, it would uh, start skipping. Bup, 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 bup. And so it was idling, it wouldn't skip. But you crack the throttle, it wouldn't start skipping immediately, but it would start skipping in just a second. And that's what the deal was. Go pay your five bucks, you're going to have to have a headlight. Headlight's messed up. Yeah, pay your five bucks and you can go to work, but pay your five bucks first. All right. And uh, the, um, yeah. Anyway, he's from welding. You can usually spot one of those guys a mile off. So. But uh, anyway, uh, I'm kidding, actually. But, <laughs> but what the deal is, um, this uh, situation when I cracked the throttle, I unplugged the EGR valve. Well, initially, uh, when I cracked the throttle and it would start skipping, I just held it there so it would keep skipping, you know, block something under the throttle where it would keep skipping because I didn't have to have it loaded. I could just crack the throttle. And it started dropping a cylinder cylinder number three or whatever it was, you know. And I took the uh, uh, stethoscope and I listened to the injector and the injector wasn't clicking. So when the injector, you know, the injector, I said, ah, the injector's not clicking. That's what our skip is all about, you know, which is what you learned yesterday, right? You know, he had one that uh, the injector was partially unplugged and uh, pulled the spark plug out and says, he said, I've got to have a spark plug. I said, no, no, that spark plug, put it back in there. Well, it's got to have, because it's got a good spark going to it. And I said, well, listen to that injector. What you unplug the injector for? <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was him. He figured it out, though. But I, I'm, in the, I'm in the same place he is. Yeah, I took that thing and I took his stethoscope and I'm listening, and I'm, a stethoscope, and I'm not hearing the injector, so I said, aha, figured this out. And so with the uh, I unplugged the, you know, with all this going on, I unplugged the um, uh, connector, and there's no signal for the injector to click. And so I checked the wire all the way back to the PCM, and it's good all the way back to the PCM. All right, I must have a PCM problem, huh? And I don't even remember what progressed after that, but I determined that when I disconnected EGR, yeah, it would, yeah, as, you know, get your, you got your receipt? You got your receipt. Okay, right Got to get, get a receipt. Walk over there and pay your five dollars to get the receipt. See, he's trying to take his truck without paying. I've seen that before. If he, you leave out of here, you would never give him pay that money. All right. So, uh, uh, so he was going to take his truck. He wasn't even going to go pay. That's why I told JD to bring me his keys. Uh, but anyway, uh, the whole deal was there's a little. These are little ports. These are little ports that feeds the EGR, right? And all of them were clogged except one. And that one was feeding all of the EGR. And all the EGR that was going to that motor was going to that one cylinder. And that cylinder was misfiring. And when it misfired on that cylinder, the PCM says, we're misfiring on cylinder number whatever it was. I think it was four, come to think of it, and because uh, it was on the front corner of the motor. And whenever it quit misfiring, when it misfired on that cylinder, it would shut the injector down so it wouldn't put gas in there and it was protecting the catalytic converter. And a lot of them will do that now. But see, it led me astray because I didn't know that strategy was built in until then. So uh, understanding how it works. See, I mean, if you got somebody that doesn't understand this stuff, they will beat their head in trying to figure out what's wrong with it. You know, and, and that's what I was, what was so valuable about what Jeremy learned on that Toyota yesterday. You know, that his, in his mind, if there's spark going to the spark plug, and I know this engine's got good compression, that cylinder ought to fire. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's what we're trying to, that's what I'm trying to get you to do is to understand this kind of stuff. And like I say, you're not going to gain anything, and I've preached about this for 10 years to people, you're not going to gain anything by watching everybody else do the work and then just writing the stuff up, you know what I'm saying? You ain't learning a dadgum thing like that. I mean, it's just one thing. Now, old uh, Mr. Slick over there, he'll just put anything down there and throw it at me. I've seen him do that. He's pretty slick. He's pretty darn slick. You do good vehicle inspections, though. I watched him do a vehicle inspection. He'll take 30 minutes to do a vehicle inspection. He checks every P and Q on that thing. All right, now then. Um, so, um, you know what he told me was wrong with the Bronco, why it wouldn't start? He said the fuel pump relay was slow. <laughs> <laughs> he did, and he spelled fuel, F-U-I-L. So, outstanding for me. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I circled and gave him 10 points off for misspelling fuel. He, oh, I know how to spell fuel. Why did I put that on there? Okay, all right, now then. Um, Okay, which type of code uses one trip logic? Which type of code uses one trip logic? And now I'm telling you, that's the one where it uh, turns it on right away. Type A. Type A. That's like a type A misfire, right? You got that? 
Everybody happy with that? Right. All right, now we're going to go to test 14. And we got a little time here. Don't you just love these here uh, sessions like this, you know, where you get all the answers to the test? And you get to listen to me talk to earn that? Which sensor is used to determine the temperature of the engine? He knew better than that. Which one is it, George? You know? I know it's Huh? I would say it's probably the engine coolant temperature sensor. Now, a 7.3 power stroke diesel doesn't have an engine coolant temperature sensor to tell the PCM anything about coolant. All it's interested in is oil temperature, which I thought was interesting the way they did that. What term is used to describe a sensor that has less electrical resistance as the temperature increases? Huh? Greg's been reading in his book. Very good, Greg. What you say, Greg? What does NTC stand for, Greg? Negative temperature coefficient. That key in the Blue Ranger. Or lay it on the hood. The Blue Ranger that's in that middle stall. Yeah.